Give it up for Nikki Romero. All right, let me see. So there's a bunch of people here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, well, my name is Nikki Romero, or Nick Rodafil, for those uh, who've never seen me in, in the wild. So um, thank you so much for coming to the master classes, not only to mine, but also to all the others. I want to um, really, really thank all the crew for uh, setting this up and Buckshop for arranging all this. Uh, it's a good opportunity to show a little bit how we work, and not only me, but also the other artists. Um, just for me, I just would love to know, there's a lot of people here. Is there um, Dutch people, probably, English people, producers, DJs? Who of you guys are all producing or just, DJ, or just DJs? So if you're producing, can you let me know? That's a lot of people. Oh wait, there's people upstairs too. <laughs> all right, awesome. Um, so uh, if you're producing, then we all know there's a lot of you know, software that you can use to make your songs. Uh, there's Fruity Loops, Ableton, Logic, of course. Um, Studio One. Yeah, that's really good too. Um, no, it's, it's kind of new. <laughs> it's like a follow-up of Cubase, but then in a different... Uh, working with different people to set that up, but that's an amazing piece of software. Headhunters is using in that is using that software. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, who is working with Logic here? All right, that's a fair amount. Um, Fruity Loops. That's that's a lot too. Cubase. Do we have some Cubase people here? No. Oh, you uh, up there? Oh, I'll send you the link of Logic. That's fine. <laughs> Just joking, man. It doesn't really matter what you're working with. Um, it really, like the production process is, is similar, of course. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the song Take Me. It's a song that I've done uh, last year together with the, the script. And the script really started the song as um, more like an, like an open format, like a band. It was like a band demo, not so much produced. So it was just a vocal and um, with some drums and with some chords, and that was it. Then we stripped the whole song, and then I started again, and we just took the vocal, and then we got Colton, and Colton redone the vocal, uh, because the script had a different release schedule at that time. So, um, but it was really inspired on, on a song that started out uh, as a band, so I tried to approach it the same way. Um, it's really hard to, to talk about all the details, so I'm going to try to squeeze everything in and to make sure that it's going to be easy for you guys to understand what I'm trying to say. And also the level will probably be different from all of you guys. Some of them are really, really ad like pro producers already. Some of them may, might be just starting. So I'm trying to be in the middle um, with all the stuff that I'm going to talk about. I will ask you guys if there's something that you want to know. I'll ask in, in, in between everything uh, and try to... if to ask if you can keep up with all the information. It's gonna be hard for some, maybe it's gonna be easy for others, so don't blame me, I'm trying to be in the middle. Um, well, uh, of course, especially now, music is taking uh, such a different shape. Uh, the EDM world is, is changing, it's not just 128 anymore, which it was for a while, of course. The, uh, even Zac Efron done a movie about the 128 BPM stuff. I was in it as well for uh, two seconds. Um, but now the, the music is taking a whole different direction, which is great. I think it's great for everyone. I think it, it means that there is a lot of different possibilities now. Uh, but it's really hard to make, the, the, to make a big step. Like it's, your fans are not going to understand if you're going to jump from 128 to, to 108 or maybe even to 60, 70 and then back. So uh, for me, that means I'm going to have to make a transition. And for me, Take Me was one of the transitions it really sounds a little different than my normal clip songs, and it sounds more like a radio record, which it actually is, uh, without being, in my opinion, without being too corny, because that's gonna be hard to make a, a radio song that's gonna sound corny real quick. And if there's one thing I learned from, for example, David Guetta, is that uh, a good radio record does not start as a radio record. It's just, it's, it starts as a, as a cool song, and then it's, if it's gonna be commercial later on, yes or no, that's depending on the production process. So um, with Take Me, this is a really interesting song because it started out, was, like I just mentioned, as a, as a band. 
I'm going to play a piece of the, of, of the project if everything's working well. Uh, it should sound like the original one that's out. So let's see if it works. The devil kicks the angel from my shoulder Says let's have some fun So um, one of the most questions, well, actually, one of the most frequent questions I have uh, received about this song was the, the guitar. A lot of people ask me if it's a real guitar that's playing. Well, most of it is not. Most of it is just software. And just because it takes so much time to have a guitar, uh, like someone who plays very well, I don't really play well. So I need someone who's going to play it for me, <laughs> at least uh, the media information that I uh, try to play in contact. Um, so most of the time I'll just get a plugin and I'll just play it with the plugin. I'm too lazy to bounce it out and have someone else playing it. So uh, most of that is just, um, just most of the project is plugins. Uh, we recently built a complete new studio and it's called uh, the Protocol Live Studio where we have real drums, where we have some real piano, a grand piano and a lot of guitars. So uh, I believe in that, especially where the music is going now, that you're going to need uh, live instruments. And I mean not vengeance samples. I just mean like real, real live instruments. I'm going to start recording drums myself. So most of the drum fills in there, not all of them, are done, uh, are actually played by myself or maybe a little bit adjusted uh, digital-wise. But uh, most of them are played by myself and most of the piano and the chords uh, of course, I've done by myself, but and the layers of piano are also uh, real piano layers. So uh, you have to sound different than all the Nexus pianos that are like the Dance 2K7. I mean, that's a really one that Avicii used in a lot of records. Well, he's been successful with it, so uh, that's really cool. But I believe you're gonna have to go to more live instruments. Um, so then, it was. I think it took us at least a month to find a drop for this song. Because, um, as you guys probably know, if you have a song and then you have a nice nice chord progression, you have nice instruments, and then it's like the drop. What do we need at the drop? I'm pretty sure this sounds familiar to you guys. <laughs> so um, how do you approach a drop? Well, that's really interesting, because first, you have to know uh, what direction you want to go. Is it going to be half time? Is it going to be like a normal... A normal 128 beat or maybe 127 in this case and um, this really is depending on, on, on inspiration you have on that moment and for me on this song it really came from uh, Calvin Harris. Calvin Harris I think is one of the best examples of someone who brings good pop music but then still in a cool way. If you look at his album um, 18 months or his most recent album like most of the songs could be clip records as well if the, if the vocals were done differently or if they were arranged differently, but most of them could be clip records as well. So uh, I took that information and I tried to make my own drop with Take Me. And um, well, the song will be coming back. He's done is an inspiration on, on this one. Abuga was an inspiration. And uh, I think it works so much easier if you have inspiration to get your, son, to get your uh, drop right. So the drop of this song is going to sound like this. So I think at least it took us, just like I mentioned, a really long time before we got this. And it sounds so easy and it probably is easy to make, but we had this for a long, long time. And I was like, that's too empty. That someone, like something needs to happen here. So uh, I talked to different friends and I sent it to some, some other artists and everybody said something else. So it really you end up with nothing because uh, everybody has a different opinion, of course. But um, I thought this way it would sound too much like uh, Robin Schulz, for example, but then a more high tempo, and I did, what want to, I did not want to sound so much like someone else. And this, in particular, sounded a lot like Calvin Harris to me. Um, so what I'd done, like, I, I, I took this sound, and I just like made a quick riff with it, 
sounds a little bit cheesy if I play it solo, actually. So there's a small, like a little, uh, like a, we say in Dutch, we say roffel. I don't really know the English word for it, but it's like a, like a quick, because that made it a little different than the rest. It's not even quantized right, but sometimes you get the coolest results if you don't really work uh, quantized. Quantized is really cool if, you, if you're placing hi-hats, if you're placing kick drums, but when you're doing uh, synths, it sometimes is much cooler to just don't use quantized and just use parts of it or just partly quantized. And there's a really cool function in Logic for everybody who uses Fruity Loops and Cubase. Um, I'm sorry if you don't have this the same way in Cubase or um, Fruity Loops. But uh, it's called Humanize. And if I browse through the different things here. There should be a function somewhere here that says humanize. And if you use this, everything is going to get a different velocity and also like a little offbeat quantize. So if you see, if you look at the MIDI information here, you see red dots and the red dots are slightly louder than the green dots. So that happens by using humanize and you can basically select whatever you want to select. And I humanize it, as you can see, the notes get a little different in length, and they also have different velocity. And this makes it a little more alive somehow. So this is a trick I use in many, many different songs. Um, this way, the, the synth is going to sound a little more natural and maybe a little less static, uh, a little less digital. So um, the humanized function I used, that's why all the different colors were not uh, red or blue or whatever would not, because it's different velocity. So all the notes have different lengths, and this way uh, it breathes a little more, and this way it sounds a little more playful. So then another different thing when you're doing your song, especially when you're doing a drop, uh, is layering different sounds. Because when you're programming a drop, there is always going to be the problem that your drop sounds too empty or too full. And how do you know? that you have just the right amount of different sounds. That is really interesting. So um, just, just for my own opinion, if you guys are doing like, are most of you guys doing house or different kind of sounds, if there's anyone doing experimental stuff. Um, but if you're doing house, especially on 128 or 126, 127, you're gonna have the problem that it's gonna either sound too, uh, everything is gonna sound too fast or too slow. So how do you moderate the slow and the fast feeling in a song by using, uh, by using synths? Well, um, I had the same problem with, with Take Me on the 127, because this is definitely sounding too slow. If I would mute this synth here, and if I play it out with it. Well, it really feels super slow, and then, and then it's, there's a lot of space for something that you, know, that you can uh, get in there to make it a little more, uh, I said, a little more alive, a little more, like it's speeding up a little bit. And then I try to figure out, so what can I use to make it a little more, um, to make it sound a little less slow. It took a long, long time before I came up with this thing. It sounds very cheesy in, in, uh, in solo, but then if you layer it a few different sounds, it's going to sound a little fatter, and it's going to fill the spectrum a little bit more. Um, maybe for those that signed up with my YouTube channel, I do SMCs, which is like uh, master classes of production, where I try to explain uh, information on my, um, on my mixes and on my tracks. And there's this one thing called harmonic mixing. And harmonic mixing is something that's really, really helpful when you're trying to get your drop right. Um, and also where, you get, where you're trying to get your layers right. So, for example, if you produce a song in F or in G, you want to make sure that you don't have other frequencies bothering your main synth. Um, in this song, it was really easy, because if you're playing this out, basically it has all the information it needs. Maybe with some white noise. So one of them is humanized, so that's why they don't sound so uh, equal now. But um. 
So um, how can harmonic mixing help you to get your, to get your song sound well and to make sure that you don't have to squeeze a limiter uh, so your song is gonna be still loud enough? Um, for example, when you're working in G or in F, there is this very nice website, I'm not sure if I have internet here, but uh, it's called Wikipedia, and it's called uh, Harmonic EQ. And it will tell you exactly in what key, what frequencies are being used. And you can, you can actually check it out yourself as well if you get an EQ right here. Go to channel EQ. Uh, it sounds horrible now because of that humanized example, but. Well, you, can, you, you can see exactly what's going on. You can also see where the most, the biggest part of the information is happening, and it's right here. And because the song has chord progressions, it's going to change all the time. But there's a few different, um, few different frequencies where things are happening. And if you look at the analyzer here you see a big part of the song is focused on, is right here. So knowing that, you can actually cut everything below. You can cut everything below the frequency that you can see where, it's has, where it has its most energy. So, and you see there's a big gap here. Well, this is not the right EQ for it, but I'm just gonna show you how to use it. So, Then there's a peak right here, and you can use the EQ in different bands to have the right accents on the right places. So uh, by following this, this way of, of EQing, you can match your sound and you can shape it the way that it only takes the information it needs in, your, in, in the um, EQ spectrum. And this way there's going to be a lot of space left to master your song. And it's going to be a little bit harder when your song has, uh, has chord progressions. But when your song has just like one key where everything is working, it's a really a nice tool to get your song sound fat because there is a lot of information left if you do this with every instrument. Well, as you can see, this is a like, a, like a quick example, but if you can apply this on different instruments and different sounds, that means there's going to be a lot of space left in, uh, in the mix to get it loud and to get it sounding uh, fat in the end. So a good sounding master is always about space in the mix. And if your mix is too full, it's not gonna sound fat. Um, because you just need space to get everything loud. Well, this is, a, uh, I'm trying not to uh, focus too much on mixing now, but it's just so hard to get everything uh, explained in just a short time notice. Um, so that part of, of, of um, of harmonic mixing is really important. Just look at the key, go to Wikipedia, there's this, call, there's this page called um, harmonic mixing or harmonic EQing, and then you'll find the notes matching the, the key that you're working in, and make sure you EQ, EQ around, that, um, around that frequency. And everything you don't need, just cut it away, because it will only take space in your mix, especially low cuts on every instrument. Like a main synth does not need anything below 150 for sure, maybe even 200. And the vocal doesn't need anything under 150. And if you have a male vocal, it's going to be a lower low cut than uh, when you have a female vocal. But you always have to see what's happening with an analyzer to see where it's working the most on your frequency spectrum. So uh, this I've done with, with Take Me A Lot, and it means that you have a lot of space left. And this way it sounds very open and not even too full. Well, I changed some of the you you uh, you what's the thing called here humanizing so that's gonna mess up this part here but you know what I mean. Um, what's interesting about this song as well is all the um, all the music uh, the chord progression going on here. Yeah. 
is about this time of night that makes the wrong things feel so right. So there's a lot of bounces here because I lost my laptop in Japan and it's somewhere in between uh, Holland and Japan now, I think. So I have to work on um, one of my friend's laptops. So thanks, Niels, for borrowing me your laptop. <laughs> uh, that's the reason why there are some bounces here and there, why it not, doesn't sound exactly the same because the project is causing some troubles here and there. And, um, but it's about, uh, it's about the, the big picture. Anyway. Um, I want to ask you guys if there's something about this song in special, in particular, that you want me to talk about. Otherwise, I would love to just explain a little bit more. But if there's something in, in particular, any questions that people might want to ask? All right. Yeah, of course, that's a good one. The kick and bass. So this is something that is, that is really, really taking a lot of time. Because the kick and bass is probably the most important thing next to the arrangement and the song composing, of course, to the song. Um, it causes a lot of trouble for a lot of people, and it really is, especially 60 per I think 60% is your space that you're working in. Because um, to get your kick and your bass right, you need to make sure that, you're heard, that you hear it well first. Because if you don't hear it well, how are you going to fix something? So make sure that you have a good headphone, and I would recommend, for example, the QC25 of Bose or maybe even um, the Bayer Dynamic DT990 Pro, because that's headphones that have uh, the ability to, to show you low end, and then it's easier to fix, because I would, I would start there, and if you have a good space with good acoustics, then you can do it in your studio, of course. But it's really hard to, get, to fix something if you don't hear it right. So that's the first step. And then, um, I think, uh, again, it's really important to have a look at your frequency spectrum to see what's happening and what is the kick drum actually doing. Are you using a, a, a big kick drum, like a long one or a small one? And Because if you use a long kick drum, it's going to take a lot of space in the mix, which means that you cannot have a bass playing at the same time, otherwise it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, uh, kill the space in your mix. With this song, I use a very small kick. I think was I made it a long, long time ago. It's called... Romero Feb 2012, that is the bass. That means that the kick is four years old. It doesn't really matter, it's about the punch. And if you look at the bass here and the kick drum, it's really, really not complicated at all. But And um, I am very, very lucky because I have a studio where I can hear everything very well. It makes it much easier to get it right. But um, first, the most important step is to find the right sidechain. Like, how do you find the right sidechain settings to your kick? Now, there is a plugin, and it's called, I'm not sure if it's on this laptop, because mine is still in between Japan and, and, and the Netherlands, but there might be a plugin here installed um, that shows it very well. Uh, let me see if it's here. Exactly. I, I talked about it in one of the SMC master classes on YouTube, but I don't think it's here. The Bram Electrics. So there is a plugin. I don't have it here then, but there is a plugin and it's called. Um, yeah, exactly. By Bram, Bram something. Can you maybe bring your laptop here with yours, maybe? <laughs> Doesn't really matter. So what it shows you, and the plugin, uh, what it shows you is, if you're playing the kick solo, it shows you exactly how long the waveform is. And if you know how long the waveform is, then it's going to be much easier to have your sidechain settings right. Because if you look at the frequency select, uh, the frequency of the um, of the sample, then you can tell exactly where you need to sidechain. And sometimes you only have to sidechain the low part of the kick. Um, that, for example, with the, the Vengeance Multiband sidechain. Uh, but in my case, I use my own sidechain uh, plugin a lot, which is called Kickstart. And if uh, Niels does not have this plugin, I'm going to have to punch him in the face. But uh, <laughs> doesn't really matter. He's, he just started producing, so. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, exactly, it's that one, yeah. So thank you very much. Can I borrow your laptop for a second? <laughs> yes, thanks. All right, so uh, this is the plugin I'm talking about. Uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. And, um, but this, this shows you exactly what your kick drum is doing. And uh, do you have a kick drum here somewhere? So this is awesome. I'm doing a masterclass without the right plugins. But um, at least it's about the effect. But what the most important thing is, is that it shows you exactly where to place your sidechain. And this kick drum is not very, very long. As you can see, actually it's very short. So that means I have a lot of space to do my sidechaining. And I have a lot of space to have a, uh, a bass playing at the same time. And if I look at the sidechain settings for this bass, it's just a compressor of logic because it sounds the most natural to me. Um, sometimes if you use a volume shaper or if you use the LFO tool or my, even my own kick, my own kickstart uh, plugin, it's not going to sound natural enough for certain songs. And this song was not really working well with another sidechain. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you very much. So this is the plugin and it shows you very well. I'm not sure if you can see it, that the kick drum has a certain length. And if you change the kick drum's length, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change also the, how uh, you said it, the image of the kick drum here. And um, if you have a bass playing, for example, I'm going to switch on a, do you have a bass as well here? <laughs> Toban. Yeah, so if you have a bass playing, it's going to show you exactly if it's, if it's sidechain enough, yes or no. So um, it's about the big picture. And As you can see, I'm using, I'm using the normal compressor of logic here. It's, uh, it's linked to a sidechain bus, which is bus 3, and it gets a signal. Let me see, right here. It gets a signal, I think, on top here, there is this. Yeah, I always use a trigger and it's built in a plugin from Logic itself, Ultra Beat, and it's called uh, the Rim Shot. And the Rim Shot is a very, very short sound that really triggers the side chain, that's it. Because the longer the trigger, the, l the, the, the longer the side, like the more time it takes before the side chain kicks in. So I make sure that I have a very short trigger and this way my side chain will work very quickly. So just logic and it's rooted to a bus and it's linked to a side chain here. If you, as you can see, it's going to bus three. So um, are you producing a song? Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, yeah. Awesome, thank you very much, that's, that's great. So thank you very much. There's. There's a good example here of what's going on when you're using this plugin. So what's in between here is bass, and the big, like the big parts here is the kick. That's what's peaking. And if you, uh, if it looks like I'm gonna exaggerate a little bit here. So this is gonna show you the bass probably. And as you can see, there is already a short side chain going on because it stops exactly at the spot where the kick should be. So how do you make sure it sounds fat enough? Well, just make sure that the bass does not kick in until the kick is gone. And this is a plugin that can show you exactly when it's gone. That's why I use it so much. So it's called uh, the Smart Electronics by Bram and Shans. I think it's even a free plugin and it's really helpful getting your kick and your mix right. Thank you very much for wearing that. And I think another thing is also uh, make sure that you locate it the right way, especially for this song, Take Me, there's two different layers playing the same thing. And if you have two different basses, that means that you have to cut one or the other, otherwise it's gonna be too much in the mix. So this one is cut at like 140, and as you can see, I made a really small 
um, volume adjustment here. I made it a little bit louder at around 245 because that's where the energy is of this song in this particular key. And that is, again, this harmonic mixing. Even I could, low, I could high cut the, the bass here, but I was just too lazy to do it probably. Um, but the more you cut away, the more space you have in the mix, which means that your mix can be louder. And this part is probably, oh, this is gonna be just a sine wave, so it does not have like a top end, but it is low cut at 50. I actually do a low cut on my master chain, and it's gonna, always gonna be something around 30 to 40 hertz, because everything below that, in my opinion, is not working on a big PA. It's just gonna make sure that, or when, when you don't cut the bass out, then if you play it live, then it cannot be as loud as a, as a low cut song, because the, the limiters will just kick in and they will just make sure they duck your sound. This, that sucks, it sounds really bad. So that's how I do it, That's work, that works well for me. And I hope that I answered your question that way. <laughs> yeah, any, any, anything else, anyone else? Uh, yeah? Can you show a bit the mixing the Roman part, but in the right, like the drums? Yeah? Uh, sure. Take me to the heaven I So um, mixing live drums is something totally different than mixing digital drums because live drums uh, have a lot of headroom. That means that you have to give them the space. Like a digital kick drum is just like tack and that's it. And a, and a live drum also has the attack of the hammer hitting like the, the how do you say that, like the, the, the first uh, shield, I don't even know how, how to name it. but. Anyway, there's, there's different sounds creating an, uh, an analog kick drum. That's really hard to get, that, to get it right. And what I do is just, I don't limit, I don't compress, I just EQ it a little bit to make sure, again, with harmonic mixing, that I have the right accent at the right, uh, the right frequencies. Because also, a, 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 the analog kick drum has a certain tone, it has a certain, uh, certain key. So I make sure I cut away everything below, and the kick drum of an analog, um, drum kit does not have to be so low as, an, as a kick in, in a digital, for example, at the drop, because I make sure I locate everything under 60 or 70 on an analog drum kit. That means that the bass has a lot of space to move freely. Uh, so I can just have a, have a sine wave playing here without any trouble, because you cut everything below 60 to 70 on an analog drum kit. Um, and next to that, there's a, called, a tool, it's called Brainworks Control, and there you can have like a nice stereo mix, you can widen the toms and you can widen the, the cymbals a, a, little bit, a little bit more than it normally is. And this way you have like a nice and wide analog drum kit working together with the bass, because it takes no space in the mix. Yeah, but there's no particular mixing part, it's just listening what works best for you, and if you don't have an analog drum kit, I would just use Contact because Contact has great drum kits. For example, the 80s or the 70s, 60s drum kit. That sounds great. Yeah. Anyone else with a particular question on this song? Yep. Yeah, so um, that is a really good question. The vocal processing, of course, is for every song. It's different. Uh, even the, um, the reverbs and the delays are different for every BPM. But what I do most, uh, I think on this part, let me see here. I think I did all the processing in a different project because it just takes up too many different plugins. But there is a plugin, it's from Waves, and it's the CLA, I thought it was called CLA Vocals right here. That really works well. This is like a quick fix for everything. You can compress really easily, you can layer really easily. Um, but I would just put this on an auxiliary, and if you have six different parts of, of vocals singing at the same time, I would just like manually widen them with left and right instead of just using a plugin like Brainworks, because then you have face problems. And you can, I would just rather have, if you have the ability to, to, to talk to the vocalist, I would just rather ask him to sing it like 12 times the same, the same piece. 
and then you have 12 takes to choose from, and then you just pick the best ones, and most of the times for a chorus, maybe that's like four or five different layers, maybe even six, and then you have an octave up playing the same, uh, or singing the same part. And then you put this on, on the uh, auxiliary of all that, vocals playing at the same time, and it's gonna give you a nice quick result of how it should sound like when it's, uh, when it's finished or when it's, when it's right in the mix. You have like a nice option here to add a little bit of reverb, you have a little bit of compression, so it's a little more in your face. And then a really nice plugin I use a lot is, um, I don't think we have the UAD here, but I think Waves has a simulation. And it is right here, the Puke Tech. And this is a trick that I learned from a, a producer that produces with, uh, or actually a lot of songs for Rihanna. He adds, he always adds the 12K here and he boosts it a little bit to get like the nice, like the breathy sound in your vocal. Like uh, you hear like a lot of like the breath part of your voice. So, and it makes it really breathy. And to me, that sounds great on almost every song and on almost every voice. So the Puke Tech has a different version for UAD as well, and then it's called the Pool Tech Pro Legacy, I think. Um, so that is the, then, I've, then I do like a little bit of Fab Filter with um, the Diamondless EQ, the, the EQ, the Fab Filter EQ, the, the, the newest one. Let me see if I have it here. So the Pro Q2 here, and um, this is a really nice EQ, and same as the Logic one. It shows you directly the result on what you're doing in the analyzer. And uh, there's much more cool stuff with the Pro Q that you can do, like you can rip out kick drums and everything from a song, but it really works well with the vocal um, processing as well. And, but next to that, uh, an H delay works great from Waves, uh, just to give it a little bit of delay. And I don't use a lot of verb, but if you use verb, there's the EOS of audio damage. And that sounds really amazing. It's a really small plugin. It does not use a lot of your CPU, and it sounds really amazing. Just a few knobs, and you have a nice verb. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But there's a whole different topic, like mixing vocals. I still have to learn a lot. Yeah. So what's your advice for bass sounds? For the bass sounds, um, well, it's it, with bass, like the real bass in my, like in most of my projects comes from the sine wave, because the sine wave, there's a, you have a lot of control over your sine wave. Like if you have a nice cool sample, uh, I always cut out all the lows from a sample, because you never know how it's behaving. And uh, with the sine wave, you know exactly how it's behaving, because it's MIDI controlled. And um, I would always just go for an EXS24 if you're working with Logic, and otherwise there's great, great sine waves in, uh, in the Nexus even. I can maybe open one here, uh, or actually, do we have a dongle? Let me see if we can open it real quick. And there's a preset in Nexus that has amazing bass. Well, there's, there's new plugins so fast that have great sinus as well, but, uh, and it's right here. It's just a sine wave, and it's right in the folder of bass, and this one sounds great. And I just put on a, a small overdrive, uh, like a distortion here, overdrive on top of it to have it a little bit in your face, the drive a little bit back here. And this way, it's, it's, it's straight in your face. Let me see if I can, no. If I can open a musical typing. Oh. So it really, it really sounds nice and easy real quick. And then the cool part, if you do it with Nexus, is that you also have a control to have a portamento or to have a small effect going on, or you can even adjust it with the mod wheel, and with the Nexus it sounds really, and it, and it works really easy, that's why I use it. Yeah. So any more questions on Take Me, the song? That's easy. One more? Yeah. Um, so, John Christian is a really good friend of mine, so I know exactly uh, 
I've been working in his studio for two years, so we learned a lot from each other. What he is doing with the LFO tool, he's using it uh, in two different ways. So one is ducking like the, 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 the normal sidechain part that you have is ducking the sound that you want to sidechain. And then he puts another one on top to have a little bit more control. And then there's another one that's just like making sure that before the first transient of the kick kicks in, it's already ducking. And if, let me see if I can show you real quick what I mean. Uh, so what he is doing, for example, is this could be his first. And he always puts on smooth a little bit. And what he's doing, he's doing, basically he's doing this. Oh. Really aggressive, and then he's putting, he's putting on another one. So let's copy it real quick. And then he does this. Oh, oh that's linked now. So he does this to make sure that the transient, even the first transient of the kick, is being ducked by the second LFO tool, just to make sure that you have nothing playing at the same time of the transient, which means there's more air in the mix so it can be louder again. And if someone's loud, it's John Christian on his record, because he's one of the loudest that I know, but that's also because of multiband compressing. He does a lot with uh, the C4 of, of waves, making sure he's squeezing all the low end all together. It has to be your taste, but if it's loud, yes, it's extremely loud. Yeah. One more? The tail, yeah, yeah. Well, you can, you can cut the tail using a side chain, but uh, I would not prefer using a plug-in to do that. I would just rather prefer to, to cut it off by sample, but then you have more control again. Otherwise, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If that was it, I'm sorry, but then you can just also chop it off by using sample or just audio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could be both ways. I, I want to thank everybody very much for uh, coming to check out this uh, tutorial and masterclass. Again, uh, Buckshop and all the team. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you want to know more about production, I do a lot on YouTube, it's called SMC, you can just subscribe and I'll talk about songs and different techniques uh, every time, a little bit more in depth for the ones that are interested. Once again, thank you very much. To get noticed? To get noticed, I think it's the most important thing that you have your own sound. Because, uh, I mean, if you're going to produce something that sounds like uh, another artist, then there is the other artist that's doing it better all the time. So if you create your own sound, it can be only you and done by you at that moment. But make sure that you have at least three records in that sound before you release the first one. Otherwise, people are going to copy your sound when it's successful and then other people rip it off with your kind of sound. So I would just have three records ready before doing that. And then make sure that you send one of the three to a label and not all three. Otherwise, they have it copied by someone else. And then there's a really big label here. I'm not going to name any names, but it's doing it that way. Make sure that you have three songs ready and um, that you just have, like, that you just send one out to all the labels, and there's a good opportunity here on ADE by having, you know, by just going to all the hotels and all the different uh, meetings, the demo drops, uh, and then just play it out. But you're gonna get noticed when you're, you have high quality songs and when you have a unique sound. And if you have both of that, there's a big chance you get noticed and that you have success. Yep. Thank you very much.